word. I'm going to do something slightly different this morning. Normally I read through the passage, but in, it's a long passage today, and I would really like to spend that time. We're going to work through it, but I'd like to just share uh, as we begin in Matthew, the first chapter in the 18th verse. But as we go to prayer this morning, as we pray for life choice, and we've got folks coming back from Trinidad and the West Indies that will be back tomorrow, so we're going to pray, continue traveling mercies over them. Fred is going down to pick them up, I think, tomorrow morning, so uh, that he would get down to Denver and back safely and all of that. But I wanted to take a moment, and if you would, please, if you have a need, I, we don't, I don't want to really, uh, but... I'm going to go to prayer, and I'm going to ask you this. If you have a need, would you just slip your hand up? Like, as we pray, just slip your hand up. Let me see that. And because uh, we've got some folks that have got some things going on in their lives, and I just want to be faithful to bring those things before the Lord with you and to continue in that attitude of gratitude in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin by going to prayer, and then I'll ask you to raise your hand if there's something going on that you would like prayer for. Lord Jesus, um, first and foremost, as, as Doug has already prayed this morning, Lord, we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would please you. Lord, as we look at the problem and we understand what it is that you would desire for us, Lord, that is what we desire also. Lord, we want to align ourselves with your heart for us and for our fellowship. Lord, we pray for those who are coming back from the Trinidad mission. We pray for traveling mercies, Lord, that everything would go well at the airport and uh, there wouldn't be any hangups anywhere. Uh, in an age where it seems like canceled flights are a norm, uh, we just pray that that would go smoothly. Lord, we pray for Life Choice, a ministry within our community that we support. We pray, Father, that the funds that have been provided will provide guidance and leadership and that there would be life sanctified because of what you do and the work that you're doing through that ministry and through ministries like ours that come alongside of it. Help us, Lord, to continue to keep uh, ministries in this community that we know are working for your glory. Help us to keep them in prayer in our daily lives, for we love them. Now, if you would, with your hand, with your eyes, uh, <laughs> with your head bowed and your eyes closed, but if you have a need, would you please just slip your hand up? Lord Jesus, your word says, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And Lord, you know the hearts of every person here. And Lord, in a way, we've just spoken that. We've just lifted that up. Lord, for a family member, for ourselves, for struggles that we're going through, for physical needs, Lord, for spiritual needs, for healing. Lord, for hearts that have been broken, we pray that there would be a mending today. We pray, Father, that your word would be quick and powerful. Lord, not only to open, but Lord, to heal. Lord, that there would be divine surgery that would take place today as we look at the wonder of your glorious birth some 2,000 years ago. And Lord, while it may not be Christmas season, it is certainly in every day a season to celebrate, to celebrate the one who would lay off his heavenly robes and become a man and walk amongst us and then present himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And so, Lord, it is in that attitude this morning that we open your word and we would pray humbly, Lord, that you would come and walk with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. God bless you. So, we were working through the first 17 verses of chapter 1, and I shared with you guys last week how excited I am when I get to start a new book, and, and how much fun it is to watch as we reveal things together, as we grow and we, we learn things, and it helps us to, to mature into what God would have us to be. And as we looked at those uh, 42 generations from uh, Abraham to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we saw the relevance of that. We also saw that there were some people within that lineage that we probably would not have picked to be the lineage of the Savior of the world. But God uses imperfect vessels like us 
for his perfect purpose. And I'm so thankful for that because it gives everyone here, everyone who's struggling, hope because God has a purpose in our lives. We're told in the book of Philippians, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it unto the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look now as we go on in verse 18 of chapter 1 of the book of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, they came to, uh, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. This was amazing. And as we get into it today, we'll see how amazing it is. And while we have this in pretty much a concise form here in the book of Matthew, if you're a Bible student, you've probably already read the book of Luke, where we see much more detail about how this all come to be. Remember that there was that priest, Zacharias. It had been 400 years. Remember that blank page we talked about between the Old Testament and the New Testament last week? And it had been 400 years, and no priest had heard God speak. And then Zacharias, his name means God remembers, had had the Lord speak through an angel to him. And then he went home to tell Elizabeth, and her name means uh, God's oath. And so God remembers his oath. And they were going to have a baby boy. And they were beyond the years of childbearing. So that was a miracle. And they were to call the boy Johannes or God's grace. So God remembers his oath and sends his grace. And then we have Mary, the handmaiden of the Lord. And she, before she's betrothed to Joseph. Now, betrothed, in other, in other translations, it says pledged. And in some yet, it says engaged or espoused. And here's the thing. That betrothal carried with it all of the things of marriage, so much so that as we get farther in today, if uh, for some reason she was not pure, he could have her stoned legally. That's the gravity of this. And it's the gravity of how the Lord feels about how we bring our marital relationship together. So she was found with child by the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. He's a just man. That doesn't mean that he's a man without sin. It means that he was a good man. It means that he was a gentle man. And of course, according to Deuteronomy chapter 22, he would know that with her being expecting, before they had come together, it would be within his right to do something public. But because of his heart, and, and, and understand, it's a beautiful thing to see Joseph's heart, not just Mary's heart. In the book of Luke, it says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Here, I want you to see the legal side of this. This is going to be a boy that he's going to raise. He's going to be accountable for the Son of God. And he's willing to step up to the plate and say, I'll take that charge with God's help. And so he as a mind. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, have you ever had that moment, what am I going to do? Sometimes, if, if we have those moments, what I've found many times is if I just open my Bible and begin to read through any of the Gospels, not to mention the letters, the epistles, that as I read through those, I find the instruction. The Lord speaks through his word to us. But here in this case, we have a divine intervention. David, or, uh, Joseph is going, what am I going to do? And the angel says, to Dave, uh, Joseph, I keep throwing David in there. Joseph, don't be fearful. I'm going to tell you what to do. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. What a beautiful thing that Joseph could have that confidence. Because he's going to do something that everybody later would say, well, we are not born of fornication. Everybody would know that Joseph had taken Mary and, and this child would be born. And they would, they would kind of hold that over Jesus' head in some way. But here in this place, he says, uh, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So now... It has been acknowledged, and it says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
we're his people. You and I are his people. Now, here he's speaking about the people, and Joseph would have related it to the nation of Israel because they were waiting for the Messiah, the one who would deliver them from uh, sin and from the hand of Rome. But as we read it today, and as they read it after the resurrection, men like uh, Luke in the book of Acts or Paul in the book of Colossians would reference back to this. As a matter of fact, if you were to go to the book of Acts chapter 4, so go right in your Bibles a little ways, to the book of Acts chapter 4, and I'm going to be picking up at verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Actually, I'm going to go to verse 11. Talking about this stone. This stone which the reject, uh, was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. This is the time of witness, as Peter is witnessing here in the book of Acts, recorded by Luke. This is the salvation. Is there In this stone, is there is, nor is there salvation, I'm sorry, in any other. For there is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. That based on what we see here. And then if you were to go over to the book of Colossians, which is further right in your Bible, a small book there, one of the prison epistles, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and I want to be in verse 20. Colossians 1.20. Actually, I'm going to go back to verse 19. Surprise, surprise. For it pleased the Father that in him, that is Christ Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. For by him, Jesus Christ, to reconcile all things or to himself, the Lord, by Christ, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That we see here in this passage today. For his name will be Jesus. Yahshua in Hebrew. Jehovah will save. Jehovah is salvation. Jesus was a Greek name. We find it used a lot. As a matter of fact, in the Bible study on Friday night, we found out that Barabbas, who was the one that they would ask for, and, and they would deliver Jesus up to be crucified, we find out that, according to Eusebius, Barabbas' first name was Jesus. How interesting. How interesting. Here as we go on this morning in the 22nd verse of the first chapter, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was uh, spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. So many times we sing that, especially during the Christmas season, as though that is his name. His name is Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Christ. But this is a title. This is an office. He is God with us. As a matter of fact, we find that now after the resurrection from time to time in the word of God. But this was prophesied 700 years before Christ was born. Somewhere between 760 B.C. and 720 B.C. There in the book of Isaiah. Now here's the miraculous thing. It's a virgin. It's a virgin. Now, some of you have studied the Word of God, and you know that the word that they used in the original translation was Alma, which is a young maiden. But there's another word, and when it was properly written, it was a virgin, a woman who had never known a man. And so that is, and, and here's the thing, that in itself is amazing. And if we go back to the book of Genesis, we find out it's the seed of the woman. Now, I'm not a biology major, okay? You guys probably figured that out already. But I understand that it's not the seed of a woman normally. It's the seed of a man that brings uh, a child through all of that. I, okay? <laughs> I'm not doing the birds and the bees here this morning. But just suffice to say, it was the seed of the woman, and God said so 700 years before it happened. Now, it says that it might be fulfilled. We're going to see that several times this morning. We're also going to see God speaking to men through dreams and angels. As a matter of fact, he speaks to Joseph four different times 
in this passage that we're in this morning. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Yeshua, Jesus. She, he had the comp, listen, he had the confidence to obey God's leadership in the revealed word. She's going to conceive as a virgin and she's going to have a son and you are to call him Emmanuel. And oh, his name is Jesus. His title is God with us. And now as we break into this, um, and, and, and I love this, that Joseph took cold showers for nine months, you know, so that this babe would be born in virtue. Now, I also want to share with you that there are some churches that teach that Mary continued in perpetual virginity. Jesus had several brothers conceived through Joseph who would probably argue that, not to mention some sisters. And we see those mentioned later in Scripture. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judah in the days of Herod the king, this is a bad dude. Wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. This star is first spoken of in the book of Numbers, chapter 24. But the beauty of it is, I don't know that it was the alignment of the planets. I don't know that it was a star moving through the heavens. I believe that it was the divine leadership of God that brought this light to be and moved this light through the heavens to the place where we're going to find them discovering Jesus as a child. But these wise men, if you were with us whenever we were studying the book of Daniel, we know that in the book of Daniel, because of the way God used Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Tebedrigo, that's the way the girls used to go. Okay? When we used to do the bedtime stories, we'd do Shadrach, Meshach, and Tebedrigo. You know? But uh, when in the, in, the, in the Nebuchadnezzar put out a litmus and he said, I've had a dream and you need to give me the interpretation and then tell, tell me the dream and give me the interpretation. If you don't, you're done. And he was the kind of guy that would do that. And so great fear fell upon everybody. And Daniel spoke to him, to the, the leader, the eunuch that was in charge of them, and said, hey, tell him not to be so hasty. I'm going to go before God. And he gets the vision. Well, he saves the wise men. He gives Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation. But none of the wise men could do that. They'd said that, Nebuchadnezzar, this is too big for us. And then, as he saves them, it gives him an opportunity to witness. And he witnesses about the Messiah who will deliver the world from sin. And 500 years later, they're following a star out of the east. The star's in the west. It says the star in the east, and that's true. They saw it in the east, but now they're moving west. They're moving from the plains of Shinar, the area around Babylon, the breadbasket of civilization between the two rivers, Mesopotamia and so on. They're moving from that area over towards Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And so that's what we see here. Now in verse 3 it says, Then Herod the king heard this. He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Let me just say real quickly, we could go into great detail about Herod, but this is a guy you do not want to meet. He was corrupt in the highest sense of the word. So corrupt that they had said from Rome that it was safer to be Herod's pig than it was to be his son. He had married a Jewish woman. He was an Edomite. If you go back in your Bible, you remember that Jacob had a brother named Esau. Esau brought forth a nation called the Edomites. And the Edomites many times stood in opposition to the nation of Israel. Herod was an Edomitian or an Edomite out of the area today that we would call Jordan. But he wanted to find grace. He wanted... He had been set in place by the Roman government. He wanted to have grace there in, in, in Israel. And so he married a, a woman named Mariami. And then later he would murder Mariami because he felt like she was trying to usurp his crown. And he would murder her two sons. Thus the saying, it is safer to be Herod's pig. 
because, of course, if he was a practicing proselyte to the Jewish faith, he would eat pork. So it would be safer to be a pig than it would be to be a son. In case you were wondering. So, and it says, and all Jerusalem would be troubled with him. Well, all Jerusalem would be, because when things didn't go well for Herod, it didn't go, didn't go well for anybody else. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he inquired from them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written by the prophet. There's another one of those places. For thus it is written by the prophet. There are over 100 of those in the book of Matthew. We're going to get into five of them today, God willing. But it says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This from the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. So it's out of Bethlehem. The interesting term, Bethlehem. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Isn't that beautiful? I love things like that. But here's the thing, too. We always have the wise men as three wise men. We're going to talk about that as we go on just a little bit. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. So it's 500 miles back out to the plains of Shinar and a little more that they would come towards Bethlehem. And so it, it wasn't something they just hopped on a bus and rode over. It took some time. And it wasn't three wise men. They brought three gifts, but it may have been many, many more. And so we go on here. It says, and they, they wondered what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go, search for their child carefully for, the young, for their young child. And when you have found him, bring word back to me, get this, get this, that I may worship him also. Right. Remember what I said about Herod. Okay. He wasn't involved. He didn't want to worship this child. This child, hey, a new king? Uh-uh, not in my books. This was a king that would be recognized by Israel. He had sought to be recognized by Israel, and he wasn't recognized by Israel. But here's a baby who would be recognized by Israel, and he's going, not on my watch. And so he wants to take him out. Look at verse 9. Then they heard the king when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. It was divine. It was divine leadership, the leadership of God. Which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Look at that. If you've got your Bibles open, and I pray you do, it's a young child, not a baby. Every year we set up our nativity, and we have it out on the lawn, and we have the the three shepherds, and just over off the side of the three shepherds are the three wise men. Eh, the three wise men didn't come along this time last year. Okay? And so what we do, my wife and I, when we set up our nativity inside the house, is we have the wise men over on the other side of the house, up on a mantle with a star above it. Okay? Because it says so here. And so this is really neat. It says, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. You know, today we were singing about the love and the glory of God and how wonderful it will be to be within the house of God. And we're here today to be gathered into his presence. But what's going to happen on that day whenever we are truly there? There's a song written a number of years ago that says, I can only imagine. And if you would with me for a minute, this great joy, exceeding great joy, that the answer of eternity is now set before me as the only child. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, verse 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Worship there is an interesting term. It means to face and to adore. Pros kanusko in the Greek. Literally, kanusko is to kiss. So it is to turn towards God and to kiss him, to adore him. 
David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. As we were singing one of those, what came to my mind was Psalm 84, where it says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. That's what these guys are saying. They have found Jesus, the one that had been told from generation to generation to generation by an itinerant prophet who dwelt in Babylon, who had been relocated there from Jerusalem after the Babylonian. And saved their lives. And now these many years later. They're seeing this fulfilled. And when they had opened their treasures. They presented gifts to him of gold. Frankincense and myrrh. Three gifts. That's where we get the three wise men. is Because of the gifts they bore. And songs that come out of the 1800s. That says about the wise men. You don't ask me to sing that. okay? Because it won't work very well. But, but the gold. For a king, the frankincense for a priest, the myrrh for a blood offering. You see, when they buried Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to take the body of Jesus with 75 pounds of myrrh. It was a burial spot. And so we have these gifts that speak of his divinity. And then being divinely warned in a dream, the wise men, God is taking care of the wise men. Seek ye, listen, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33, and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. What were they looking for? Jesus, why? Because he's the one that's going to show us the way to the kingdom of God. And so now, Here's God divinely working in the wise men to preserve them because if they go back to Herod with bad news, it ain't going to be good for them. So they said, we're out of here. Okay? And so they departed their own way to another, to another country. Now verse 13, and when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Again. Joseph is going, i got to quit eating pizza. He, arise, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until, uh, until I bring you word. So he's going, I'm going to give you progressive revelation. I'm going to tell you to go to Egypt and I want you to stay there until I tell you to leave. Now that shouldn't surprise us. I mean, that's miraculous. It's beautiful. But I, I love it in the book of Acts whenever Philip as he's cooking little ministry down at, at uh, Caesarea by the sea, you know, he's working with the youth group. They're playing volleyball. They're roasting marshmallows. They're having a big time. The ministry's growing. And God goes, hey, I need you to go to Gaza, which is a desert. And so he does. And then when he gets to Gaza, he says, I want you to join yourself to that Ethiopian charioteer out there. And so he does. And then when he joined himself to the Ethiopian charioteer, the Ethiopian charioteer is reading the book of Isaiah, chapter 52 and 53, and Philip goes, hey, nice horses. By the way, Philip means lover of horses. And so he's running through there, nice horses. By the way, what are you reading? Do you understand it? And he said, how can I understand it unless somebody tells me? It was a divine appointment. But he wouldn't have known that unless he obeyed the first things first. Here we got Joseph, and he's got divine revelation. An angel is speaking to him and saying, now you go and you stay until I tell you to leave. How many of us could learn from that? I'll raise my hand. You know, how many times God has said sit, and I went, but why? Now as we continue on, it says, and stay until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. I don't think the wise men told him that, did they? Because they didn't know. But the angel did, the Lord did. And when the wise men left, the angel said to Joseph, you've got to get out of this place. And now as we continue on, and he arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. 
So there was an urgency. And I, I really don't have a lot of time to speak about this, but listen to me. When God speaks to you, obey. Don't wait for further information. It may be that he's trying to get you out of harm's way. Or it may be that he has a mission for you to do, and he needs you to be timely in the way that you do it. And so we continue on here. And he was there, verse 15, until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, this is interesting because, again, it's in two places. It's in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 8. But then it's spoken of in the book of Hosea. Go left in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Hosea, which is a little book. It's after Daniel. So um, you get to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Lamentations, and, and then you get to Daniel, and then you're going to go to Hosea. And when you get to Hosea, stop at chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11. I mean, Daniel chapter 11. That was scary because that wasn't the text I saw here. You guys have never done that, have you? Now everybody else was there and going, well, when's he going to do it? Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. That's what they're speaking of. A prophecy from hundreds and hundreds of years before. Through Hosea, now fulfilled as we go through the birth of Jesus. As you and I discover this this morning. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. This is not what you want to see out of a king who has the right to bring life or death. He was exceedingly angry. That means he was stoked. And when Herod gets stoked, heads roll. As a matter of fact, this guy was so hated that he took the nobles, uh, as I understand it, from the nation of Israel and locked them in prison and then gave the execution order. He said, on the night when I die, I want you to kill these nobles because Herod was so hated that he felt no one would cry when he died. And so he was going to have these nobles executed so that the nation would cry over his death. Isn't that crazy? That's this guy. Now, as we go on through this, it says he was angry and he sent forth and put to death all the male children in Bethlehem in an, and his districts from two years old and under. That's where we get that time. He inquired of the star, and then he's going, I think he gives it a little bit of a bumper, and he says, anything, any male child under two years old would be a threat to the crown, take him out. Take him out. For he had determined this time from wise men, now verse 17, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and weeping, great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. You remember back in the book of, of uh, Genesis, whenever Rachel said to, to Jacob, give me children or else I die. And of course, the Lord did give her first Joseph and then Benjamin, and she died giving birth to Benjamin. But then Joseph would have a son named Ephraim who would be part of the northern tribes. And we would see the nation during the Babylonian captivity, these children would literally be slaughtered wholesale by the Babylonians. And so Rachel was weeping for her children and would not be comforted. Now again, as we see these children in Bethlehem and Rachel weeping for her children because they all know me. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. I'm going to ask you to just take that, maybe jot it down. Verse 19, Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. Here we are again. He said, I'll tell you when you can come out. Herod dies. The angel appears to Joseph in a dream. This is number three. Saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and go out of the land uh, to the land of Israel, 
for those who sought the child's life are dead. Then he arose, verse 21, and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. I love Joseph. I love Mary. I think she's sweet. I'm going to look forward to meeting her. I, I don't think she has any redemptive quality because the last thing she says in the Bible is whatever he tells you, pointing to Jesus, whatever he tells you to do, do. Good wisdom from Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay? So we don't pray to Mary. We pray in Jesus' name. And thereby, we are heard. She would say, if we were praying in her name, she would say, could you parry that over to my son because he's the one that delivers. I delivered him, now he delivers me. But here in this place, we see this, and, and he took the child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. So there's a bit of a, and understand, Israel and Egypt are only separated by about 75 miles, but many scholars feel that he didn't just go over the border into Egypt, he probably went to Alexandria. And Alexandria is about, uh, from here to Rollins, about 150 miles. So this was a bit of a migration for him. So uh, he was, he, he had Mary and he had the child and he's got everything together and he's doing on the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again. Well, maybe not. But here in this place, he's being obedient. Look at verse 22. And when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Have you ever been afraid to do something? Maybe sometimes that's God going, you should fear. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And fear is a good thing. Fear can keep us doing, keeping us on the right path, right? I, I love Jesus. I serve Jesus. But at first, when I first got saved, I feared Jesus and I didn't want to go to hell. I received Jesus like fire insurance. But somewhere along the way, he revealed himself to me and I fell in love with him. How about you? David said, I delight to do thy will, O God. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Why? Because he loved him. He made a lot of mistakes, didn't he? I mean, let's face it, David was a colorful individual. But in the book of Hebrews, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. Repentance, regeneration, and a restored fellowship with his creator. And so we continue on here. Archelaus, by the way, was not that far from, from Herod. Okay? Archelaus would have been, he was not a nice guy. And so it was right for Joseph to be fearful. He was afraid. And being warned by God in a dream. Do you see that? Put your finger right there. And being warned by God in a dream. That's number four. In the passages that we're in today. He turned aside unto the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in the city of Nazareth. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So as we've walked through now the birth and the early childhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've watched both the obedience of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the obedience of the wise men. Who is it we will obey today? Who is it that we know by name? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. My, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But here it says, He shall be called a Nazarene. If you look for that, you won't find it. But as a scholar of the word, and, and there's many of you who are, as I'm looking out here, I, I know some of you are, are very uh, apt in, in opening the word. Turn back to the book of Isaiah again. In Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And some of you are very familiar with this passage. The Friday night group is. We've been there several times. I think I've mentioned it before, but there are several Bible studies in this fellowship. Some are on a summer hiatus right now, but we'll be starting back up in the fall. Get a Bible study and get involved with it. Whether it's a ladies' study, a men's study, a group study, 
get involved with a Bible study, and let me tell you why. Because as iron sharpens iron, thus the countenance of one friend sharpens another. You're sitting here this morning, and you, God bless you, but I've gone on, it's got warm, and your minds have wandered. But when we interact together over the Word of God, we grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. And it builds relationships. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, remember that he would be called a Nazarene. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, Isaiah chapter 1, or chapter 11, verse 1. And a stem uh, from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Now, that branch is capitalized, and it should be. That branch speaks of the Lord Jesus. But as I understand this, in Aramaic, it is Nazar. It's the root of Nazarene. And so this branch, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And that's beautiful. And I want to share with you as we close this morning an old saying. Something beautiful, something good. All of my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he's made something beautiful of my life. Can you say that this morning? Can you believe that we just looked at five major prophecies that were fulfilled in the first couple of chapters of the book of Isaiah, I mean, of the book of Matthew. Mathematically, there was a guy named Peter Stoner. He was a professor of mathematics and chemistry, I believe, at, at uh, a college out in California. I had him. Uh, I lost him. But he done the mathematical probability if only eight of over 300 were fulfilled. If only eight over 300 were fulfilled. The chance that anyone else could have been the Messiah was 1 times 10 to the 17th power. In the book of Matthew, we will look at 100 of them. If 48 of them were fulfilled, it would be 1 times 10 to the 157th power. So I'm going to ask you this morning, would you let Jesus make something He wants you to know this book. He wants you to know your own heart and the fact that it can be made beautiful in the Lord's time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, I pray for us this morning. I pray for all of us here. And I would pray, Lord, that uh, you would know our hearts. Lord, that you would search us that if there's anything impure or unclean, that you would fill us enough with your spirit that there's no place for that sin. Help us to fall deeper and deeper in love with you. Lord, you promised us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we might be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that you might be glorified. Lord, help us to glorify. Lord, I pray over our church, over our fellowship. We pray over the outreaches that are going to take place in the next month or so. We pray for the children's ministries. We pray for the women's ministries. We pray for men's ministries that are coming up in August. Lord, so many things that are going on. But Lord, it isn't the things that we're doing. It's the one that we're doing. And that's for you. Lord, I pray your hand over the leadership of this church, over the men who serve with the elders. Lord, over the deacons and deaconesses. Lord, over every ministry, we pray your hand. We pray this every Sunday morning, but Lord, I'm praying for it right now. And I'm praying, Lord, if it be your will, that you would first of all provide for this fellowship. And secondly, Lord, that as you provide for us, you would um, add to this fellowship. Lord, let us seek your glory. And let us love one another because you first loved us. If you believe that this morning, if you believe what I've just prayed, would you join me in saying, Amen. Let's worship God.